It is good to be here with you. Uh, for the guest here, my name is Steve Reimer, uh, and um, I've been here one other time to preach. I'm teaching a Bible study right now for uh, a period of time, and we've had a fun time, but it's always a joy. I, I love your pastor. Uh, pastor Casey is just an incredible young man, uh, um, and just a blessing. I get to spend, I make sure uh, we go out every other week or so, and I take him to lunch and just kind of pour into him, and we just talk about life and what God's doing, and and he's always got questions. What 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 do you do in this situation? What do you do? And I, um, because of my age, I have a lot more experience than he does. <laughs> uh, pains me to say that, uh, um, and and it's shocking how many things you learn by doing it the wrong way. Yes. Oh my word. So I, I just have a lot to share with him, <laughs> and we have a fun time. But he asked me to come. Uh, um, great service and stuff. There was a misprint in the bulletin, or it's not the bulletin, but the um, order of worship, because it said I was going to come on at 11.30, so the timing was perfect, Lynn, perfect. But then it said 30 minutes next to it. <laughs> so that if you've heard me the first time, you know that is a joke. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll get through the introduction in 30 minutes, but I am kidding you, okay? For those who are here, I am kidding. You can relax. We will get to lunch around 2 o'clock. We'll be okay, all right? All right, enough of that. Open your Bibles to Psalms chapter 34. Today we're going to talk about something I feel like... Um, uh, is, is so important to our culture today, our walk with the Lord, and our influence to the lost world around us. The first time I came, I talked about prayer and the need that we need to be praying, and I challenge us, who are you praying for? Well, today it's going to be on praising God and how that affects things around us and how we should be setting the standard in that as believers because we have a lot of things to praise Him uh, for and to draw attention to Him, not ourselves or the circumstance. The sad thing is most people whine and complain all the time and they draw attention to what? Their circumstance and their poor selves. And that wasn't God's design. God designs us to point attention to Him. And we do that as we learn to praise Him. Okay? Let's listen to David. David wrote the Psalms, Psalm 34. Let's look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Verse 3, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You and we praise You for this day. And God, for the freedom we have in this country to assemble together to worship our God, the one true God. Now, Father, I pray that um, the things we've been involved in this morning or the things we got planned for this afternoon, God, for right now, help us to set that all aside. Uh, Father, help us to focus in on You and what You have to say to each of us individually. Father, I pray that you get me out of the way and you fill me with your Holy Spirit and you anoint this time. God, give us clear understanding into your word. And Father, give us the conviction to live it, to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, um, I served for about 23 years as a, a, a student pastor uh, and the uh, Lord gave me opportunities to, to minister at larger student pastors, uh, churches, which meant I had large number of teenagers. Now, most people, when they think of teenagers, they say, oh, no, give me children. Just, I was the opposite. Don't give me a child I don't, because they can't talk. I don't know what they want. Give me a teenager. You know, we don't always want to hear what they say, but I liked it because I want to know where they're at. And so God just opened a some neat doors throughout my years of ministry with them. And one is I was serving a church in Alabama. Bless you. Um, 
I was serving it, and every week, it was a, a larger church. They ran about 2,500. Uh, and every year, we would have a special week, which was, and this goes back, Mission Week. Y'all remember Mission Weeks, the way we used to do it 30 years ago? Okay. Where we would invite in uh, um, missionaries from all, all over, and they'd come in and stuff like that. And so that's what we did. And on Sunday, we had, it was a climax. It was the end of our big old emphasis. And we had Dr. Stephen F. Olford come in and, and, and speak. Now, for those that don't know Dr. Stephen Olford, Dr. Stephen Olford, he was born in South Africa, raised as a missionary, okay, was educated in the uh, United Kingdom, and then he eventually moved here and had a church in New York. He became known as the expository preacher. In fact, Billy Graham says that Dr. Stephen Olford had the greatest impact on his life than anyone. Influence over his ministry, okay? So here's this man. I had the privilege after this meeting to go. My pastor wanted me to go with him to a, an expository preaching conference at his ministry there in Memphis, Tennessee. And so we got to go there and spend a whole week with uh, Dr. Olford and just talk. It was just a blessed time. But the first time I met him was at this conference when he was wrapping the week up and talking. And he began talking about his days when he was uh, in South Africa. And he was a young boy. And he can remember one time that uh, a, a lion had come into their village and came to their area where they lived. And the lion had killed their number one cow. Okay, and so they realize uh, when a lion finds an easy meal, an easy good meal, T-bone steaks, okay, when the lion, he will keep coming back until he, there's no more, okay, he'll get his full, he'll leave, but then he's coming back. So they knew that lion was going to be coming back because there are more cows in the area. So he got a buddy of his, his neighbor, and they all, uh, they made a plan one night to, to go up and try to hunt them down, okay? Now, what their, their way of doing it, they were going to get up in, it was a stilt house. It was like a, a ford up on stilts, okay? And so the night came. It was cold. The very night, it was cold and stuff, but he says, we don't do this. We're going to lose more cows. And so he and his buddy went out, got up on top of that stilt uh, room, and just sat there. Throughout the night, waiting for that lion to come back. Okay. Well, way into the morning, they heard something. And said so they thinking, uh-oh, it could be him. Or her. It's just a, the lion, okay? And um, they all of a sudden realize, coming up stairs, their stairs, and he finally realized it was his wife. His wife realized they were getting cold. It was cold and they had to be cold. cold. So she had made them some hot soup. And she was bringing it to them for being cold. Okay. Now we're not going to, men, don't think about whether that was a very smart idea or not. Okay, A beautiful smelling soup. And you're trying to hunt a lion, okay? And here's this lady carrying it out and stuff. But she did it because of her love for her husband and for the neighbor, okay? Well, Steve, I mean, he's a uh, mature man at this time when he's talking about it. He, but he starts talking about his mama as if it had just happened last week. He just remembered it. And he was just praising her, talking about her, and just went on and on and on about his mama. And it was just a beautiful story. Now listen to me, church. I don't know if there's anything that draws the attention faster or more than when God's children sing His praises. Okay. When His children start talking about His greatness and how good He is and all that He's done for them. And they start just exalting him for all that he's done. Okay. Here in the passage that I read, David sings the praises of his God. And in so doing, he shares a threefold process of true biblical praise. 
So if we understand these three things, we will be able to consistently praise God the way God wants us to praise Him. Okay? Let's look at the first thing. Verse 1 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praises will always be on my lips. I will. David starts off and says, I will. Folks, it is a decision that you and only you can make for you to praise God. No one else can make it. Your parents, your wife, your husband, no one else can make you praise God. It's a decision that each of us make. On the flip side of it, when we don't praise Him, we also made that decision. We chose not to. David here in the very beginning strongly pronounces, I will. Okay. It was a decision that he had to make for himself. In the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, there's a book. It's the, it's the, it's the eighth out of 12 Minor Prophets, Habakkuk. Okay? It's a small book, just a, a few chapters long. It's the 35th book in the Old Testament, but probably there's a bunch in here that's never really read it. Okay? Because it's just hidden back there. It's little and we're, we're busy in the New Testament and the big, big ones in the Old Testament. Okay? But it's a beautiful book if you read it. Okay? Habakkuk is the author. He's the prophet. Okay? We know less about Habakkuk than anybody else that wrote part of, the New, uh, part of the Bible. We know less about him. We just don't know much at all. Okay? But when you start reading his book, it starts off this way. Habakkuk complains. Okay? He complains to God. He says, God, what's going on? Why do you keep letting the wicked prosper? Why do they keep standing tall? Why don't you knock them down? Why do they keep doing good and the rest of us who are trying to do right don't seem to be prospering? God, why? 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 Have you ever felt that way? God, I've done all I can and I just keep, I can't get off my knees. I keep getting knocked down. I can't get ahead. Okay. Habakkuk makes a, his complaint before God and, and, and just basically challenges God. Why? Why won't you stand up and take care of them? Okay. Then God answers. And God says, hey, don't worry, I got this covered. And he begins talking about how he's got it covered. He... In his sovereignty says, I'm going to send a nation and they're going to wipe out and take care of the, the wicked. The only problem with his solution was the nation, the Babylonians that he was going to use were the most wicked of all the people. So he was telling them, hey, we got this covered. I'm going to use the most wicked of all nations and people to take care of these bad people. Have you ever prayed and just struggled through something and God answered you and you didn't like his answer? Has that ever happened to you? It has me. Way too many times. It happened to Habakkuk. He, he didn't like God's answer. He didn't like it at all. And so he came back a second time. It amuses me every time I read it. But Habakkuk gave God instructions on how to handle the problem. Anybody in here ever told God how to handle the problem? <laughs> Hello? We all have it, right? When God's spoken to us and we feel like, God, I've got a problem. My child, I have the problem here. God, do something. And God's, oh, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. No, don't do that. This is how you're supposed to handle it. 
and do it now. We're always trying to tell God how to do his job. And we forget that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. God can do anything the way he wants to do it, when he wants to do it, and it's righteous and proper. He's God Almighty. He can do it. And how many times do we take our daily challenges to God and then we tell him how to handle it? All the time. If we're honest with ourselves. We do it all the time. Or even on top of that, we don't like the answer he gave us. Okay. Well, Habakkuk went back and said, God, I don't know about that plan of yours. You know, you're using the worst of the worst. Why are you using the worst of the worst? This is what you need to... And finally, he just talked long enough to realize, I probably ought to be quiet. Not making a whole lot of sense. And then God comes back and responds. And God tells Habakkuk, says, look, I'm still going to use the Babylonians even though you don't like it. But I'm going to use them. But I'm going to use them. And as I use them and they start destroying all your other enemies, they're going to get haughty and they're going to get proud of themselves. And he says, and why they are on top of the chart in their own minds, I'll destroy them too. Okay. And then all of a sudden Habakkuk, I think he realized what he had been doing and he, he finally got it. In Habakkuk 3, 16, he says this. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Habakkuk finally got it. You know, sometimes, and it's getting worse and worse, it just seems, in this culture. But it, it seems like more and more people think that life is all about ourselves. It's all about me, 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 me. Church, I don't want to pop any bubbles, and if that's where you stand, that's where you stand. But please hear me clearly. Life is not about anybody in this room. It's about the Almighty that we worship and serve. It's all about Him. It will always be, it always has been about Him, and it will always be about Him. And our life that He gives us, we live to point people to Him and to bring praise and honor to Him. That's what our life is all about. So it doesn't matter whether we're poor, whether we're rich, whether we're Tall, whether we're short, it doesn't matter. Why? Because God just wants us to point those around us to Him and ex exalt Him. That's what our life is all about, church. It's not about you getting your way. Any amens there? No, it's a painful amen because we all want our way. I want my way. We all do. But as gently and as soft-spoken as I can tell you, you're laughing at that. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> it is not about us. And it's not about us getting our way. It's about Him getting His way through us and in us. Amen. And Habakkuk finally came to the point where he says, even if there aren't crops on the fields and nothing's budding, even if there's no sheep or no cattle in the pen, even though I see nothing, I don't see God doing nothing, I 
will praise Him. Why is it, church, we don't praise Him until we see something? We're always wanting to see proof of God. Habakkuk finally got it. And he exalted God way before he ever saw anything. Okay. It starts with a decision. True praise. And then it says extol means to bend the knees, to kneel by implying to bless God. And he said at all times. It's easy when we bless God during the good times. But that wasn't the case for David when he wrote this. You know the circumstance when David wrote this? David had killed Goliath. And what meant huge victory was created problems for him because the minute he did that and he got the people looking at him, what happened to King Saul? He became insanely jealous of David and he began a lifetime pursuit of David trying to kill him. In fact, he never stopped trying to kill David until the day Saul died. I mean, he spent his whole life pursuing David. He'd have those up and downs with David. And he'd want David to come and sing and play the harp and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden he'd get jealous and throw a sword at him and try to kill him. It was constantly trying to pursue David to kill him. So David had had all he could muster up for that time. And so he went to an enemy... Achish, the king of Goth, for safety. He went there one, he went there just to chill out, but unfortunately the people recognized him. Why? Because David was so famous because he was the greatest of the great when it came to warriors. And so all the nations feared him. They knew who he was. And he was there. Okay. Now, follow this because this makes no sense. Here we've got the greatest warrior the world had ever known at that time. David. Okay. He goes to a, an area and he wants to just hang out and chill out, but the people recognize him. Okay. And so the people start recognizing him and then they want to take him and uh, take him captive, stuff like that. Do you know what David did? Now, we want to read in the books that David was that warrior and he just took out his sword and took care of them. But do you know what the Bible tells us David did? David acted insane. He acted like he was out of his mind. Literally, a cuckoo. So the people left him alone. Because he was out of his mind. He would lost his mind. And then he left. And then he continued on and he went to a cave. He found a cave in the Dulum. The cave of the Dulum. Okay? And there David waited for a period of time for his fellow outlaw army to assemble and come with him, okay? And so remember, David's now, he's sitting in the cave, he's waiting for his buddies to come. He's waiting for them. And remember, he's there only because he's hiding from the king who wants him dead. And it's during that period that he's waiting, he writes Psalm 34. So he didn't write it when he was on top writing in from a triumph war. He didn't do it when he was anointed or crowned the king. David wrote this psalm when he was hiding like a little baby, scared of death of his life in a cave. He wrote this. And what did he say? Did he talk about, God, you should take out Saul? God, when I have a chance, I'm going to take him out? We already know that when he had the chance... He didn't. Why? Because David understood the sovereignty of God and he respected and loved and honored God so much that he said, God, we're going to do it your way. Your way only. David at any time could have taken out Saul. He was the, the warrior. But he honored the man God had put in charge. And through that weight, he wrote this beautiful psalm. Of Psalm 34. You know, people respond differently and it's a will. We know also in Scripture in the book of Job. Not Job, but Job. Okay? 
Job was known as the wealthiest man in the East. He had everything and he had sons and daughters. And when, if you've read the story, which most have in this, we know that he lost all of his wealth. Okay? And with that, he lost all of his children. So the only thing left was he and his wife. Okay? Here is how both of them responded to the exact same situation. Job said, in chapter 1, 21, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I have departed. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed. You want to hear how his godly wife responded? This is how Job's godly wife responded. Chapter 2, verse 9. She, his wife, said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> Whew, that's the kind of woman every man needs by his side, isn't it? <laughs> Guys, don't you respond to that. Just smile and don't respond, okay? We'll do marriage counseling afterwards. No. <laughs> They both went through the same thing. The same thing. And one, one just broke out and had a worship of praise before God. And the other one, all she could do is curse him and tell her husband, you might as well die because you're not worth anything. Okay. So why do I, I'm spending a lot of time on this one point because it starts with the will. It's not going to just happen. We have to decide our reaction and our behavior. And we do. David, as he wrote this, regardless of his situation, and Job as well, made the decision, through it all, I'm going to praise him. It starts with the will. And then praise flows to the emotion. Okay, starts with the will, but it flows to the emotion. Look at verse 2, it says, My soul will boast in the Lord. Okay, soul refers to the inner person, including his emotions and moral nature. It's who he is, his personality. He, okay, and he says, praise flows to the emotion. My soul, ooh, deep inside will boast in the Lord. It's not an intellectual. He didn't say, oh, my mind is going to really thank him and, and praise him. Oh, no. He said, my soul will boast in the Lord. We saw that many times to David. David was also the one that ran down the uh, city square naked, praising God after victory, right? Uh, now, he wasn't literally naked. He was in his underwear, okay? Close enough. But he didn't care. He was so excited about what God had done that, man, he was just shouting his glory. Praise flows to the emotion. Praising God is a very emotional event. Um, some people handle it inwardly and can just sit there and just be very emotional and worked up and just, oh, just love on God and not say a word. Others are loud. The, the soft one is, I, I, we were doing a camp one time, uh, and um, God was just moving, and, and David Walker was the preacher, and I had invited him, and I was sitting next to him, and we're sitting on the, uh, we were sitting actually over to the side, and it was a large, I had, there was about 500, four or 500 teenagers there, and we were having a worship set was going on, and it was Thursday night. And all of a sudden, one of my counselors from back there walked down. During the worship time of music, walked down. And he laid himself down on the floor and began praying. And you could tell he was disturbed. He was, he was crying. Another one. This time a teenager came down and started weeping. Then another one came down. And after about five or six people came down, I was over here and I was just praying, oh God, send your spirit, move, move. And David, <laughs> David looked at me and he looked at me and says, I ain't preaching tonight. You're on. 
<laughs> I said, well, excuse me? <laughs> he said, I'm not preaching tonight. It's yours. What he was saying is, you're the pastor of these kids. And the Spirit's moving right now. There's no need to preach. The Spirit's got a hold of them. Now, you as your pastor should know them well enough to know how to guide them. So you're guiding them tonight. Okay? I grew greatly through that experience because I was a young man and this was more experienced pastor. And man, I, I grew. But during that time, we just saw that whole thing flood. And it wasn't anything loud. It was during soft, beautiful worship music. And God just began breaking people. And they were coming to, to the altar and they just started weeping just by themselves. It wasn't a group huddle or anything. They are doing it individually. You see, that's how some people respond to God and His move and His touch on them. They're quiet about it and they, it just touches them and they, they just deal with it. Others are loud. I had a dear friend of mine. Uh, he wasn't a close friend. He's more of a, a dear acquaintance because I saw him a lot, but I didn't know a whole lot about him. But he was from Haiti. Okay? Bless you. He was from Haiti. Okay? He would come in my worship services and he asked me if he could because we had an incredible worship service. I had a beautiful band that just sang great worship. We'd have four to five hundred teenagers every Wednesday night and I'd preach the word to them and it was just a beautiful service. And he came and he says, Pastor Steve, can, do you mind if I come? I said, brother, you can come because I, I knew his spirit. Now, this is the guy that you have to you learn quickly about him because he's from Haiti, okay? Two things about him. One is, I'm not sure why I'm walking around like this, but one is um, they clap on the half beat, not the whole beat, okay? So their claps are off, okay? That makes sense to music people. It doesn't make a bit of sense to me, but they, I was told that they clap on the half beat and we're on the whole beat. And so the minute we stop and we lift our hand up, he's... Clap. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, he doesn't have any beat. And someone finally <laughs> explained to me, no, he does. He's beating the way he would, you know, they beat. Okay. okay. Another thing is, man, when the spirit would touch him, he would shout. And I mean, you think I'm loud? He would shout. Glory. Hallelujah. I mean, and, and you would never know when it was coming. So if you're near him, you had to just be aware that if the Spirit moved him and hit him, it's going to get loud and you're going to be scared to death for just a, a, a quick, because he would shout. But he loved Jesus deeply. Okay? Take it a couple of years later, I was preaching at what they called big church. Okay? Preaching at big church. And my friend from Haiti came and Wanted to be in that service. And so he was sitting right there. Sitting right there. And the worship got moving. And I really sense, man, the Spirit is blessed. It's, he's using this worship. This is a sweet time. So I knew what that was going to happen. He shouted. Now, now he's no longer with teenagers. He's with the mature people. And he shouted, hallelujah, and he just went on. Okay. Two rows in front of him over on this side were three um, longtime church members. They had accomplished a lot in the church and contributed a lot. You get the picture? When he started... And he got in the spirit. I looked in, at them and they were getting so irritated. How could he make someone? Hey, yeah, this is our service. You, you, you know, you could just see that attitude. They were just going and stuff like that. And so it calmed down. I don't know how much it calmed down, but it, finally it was my turn, my turn and I was supposed to come and preach. <laughs> I went back down and was just talking to the audience the group, and I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, I know a lot of y'all were a little irritated today. I know that. 
to me here too. <laughs> I, I'm telling you. We'll, we'll talk to Casey about that. Um, but I said that. And then I went and put my hand on, on my friend. I said, let me tell you his story before you just write the pastor all these letters. Actually, they didn't write, then they emailed. But I said, this is my friend from Haiti. Okay. He's a dear brother. I love him deeply. Now, he worships a little different than we do. Okay. He's a little more expressive. He's a little louder than most of us. But he loves Jesus. I said, listen to me, church. The reason he still gets and acts that way, there's only one reason. And unfortunately, it is the reason why we don't. And it saddens me. Is that my friend from Haiti still remembers what it's lost without Jesus. And he still knows the struggle day to day when he didn't have Jesus. And when he's in the worship and starts praising God, he just gets so excited. Why? Because it brings back his freedom. He was delivered from that horrible situation. And he's now here in America but he's free spiritually. And he deeply loves God. And he has not forgotten what it's like to be lost. And I said, church, our biggest problem is most of us have forgotten what it's like to be lost. And we want to walk around primed and just proper. Because we've been saved for so long. And we forgot what it's like to go to bed night after night, sleeping on the ground, sleeping in a dark, just a horrible place, or even if it's a nice place, but being empty because you don't know Jesus. <laughs> I can assure you, there were no letters written to the pastor that night. <laughs> Folks, Worshiping God is a deeply emotional thing. It's not just another business deal we made. Okay. It's a life-changing decision we made that took us from emptiness of nothing and gave us hope for the first time in our life. That's what Jesus does to us. And may we never, ever get over it. It's an emotional thing. And then the last thing. Remember, it, it, it starts where? With the will. You decide. Okay. And it doesn't matter. I don't care about how bad your job is or your home situation. It's a decision that you have to make. So it starts with the will and it becomes, and then it spreads to the emotion. And then it spreads to others. Listen to the end of two and three. It says, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Let them hear and rejoice. Verse three, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. True praise spreads. When we live a life of biblical praise of God, we spread it to other people. Other people find out about our Savior. Why? Because we, we are just so connected to Him and we want to just praise Him and exalt Him that it affects those people around us. Even the ones that don't like you, even the ones that hate the church because they've had bad experiences, they still like you. Why? They still want something that you have. Why? Because you're different from them. What's different is that you don't keep singing the poor me pity story. You don't start always talking about, gosh, I had a really bad day today. Man, you won't believe what all I... You know, I, I don't care. I don't mean that to be rude or anything. But we all have bad days. We all have bosses that are arrogant and, and not fair and treat us wrong. We all have that or have experienced that. What's the big deal? 
The big deal is God's there. He's there to lift us above it and walk us through it. He's there for us to point people to Him. And you don't point people to God when you keep complaining about your circumstance. You point Him to Him when, man, you're going through a tough, tough time and you still point to Him and sing His praises and exalt Him. Church, if we're going to make a difference in this community... It's going to start with individuals that decide. I don't care how tough life gets for me. I'm going to sing his praise. I didn't say you got to preach on the street corners. I don't say you have to go up and just tell, do you know Jesus? Are you saved by the blood? You don't have to do that. Even though some people do. All we have to do is just praise him for his goodness. Even through the tough times. Just praise Him. Exalt Him. Lift Him up. Because when the lost world sees a man going through the same thing they're going through, but he's got a smile on his face, and he's got peace and rest in his soul, they want to know what's up. Because it changes. I want to congratulate. I have a dear friend, a dear friend, fellow pastor that served on my staff, works a store on, main, uh, on 50. And I talked, was talking to him this week, and he said that two ladies from this church have come there twice now and have invited he and the owner to the church. Thank you for doing that. I don't even know who it is, and it doesn't matter. But thank you for doing that, but that's what I'm talking about. Just being real with people. Just living your life. And just be real. I don't mean to be a fruitcake and be some strange Christian. I run from them. I had a guy at UCF that I went to school with that I don't, it's just true. I had a guy at UCF that I went to school with. And um, there's a group of us that were strong believers and just love the Lord and stuff like that. But I have to be honest with you. Whenever I saw him coming, I kind of went the other way. And I loved the guy to death, but... He was odd. He was just different. You know what I'm talking about. He was just different. And what he would do is if he saw me come and he'd be from here back to the water buckets over there. And he'd say, Steve, how you doing? How's Jesus treating you? Have you been washed in his blood? And he's saying this across campus. I'm thinking, dude, will you be quiet? Why are you doing that? So the best way I handled it was just to avoid him. Why? Because I, I, that's not for me. That's not for me. But relationally, man, I love sitting down and talking, going for a motorcycle ride or going to eat. I love it. And just talking about life and, you know, what's going on and just presenting the side of Christ of what he's done for us. What an impact. And then that day will come when they look and just say, man, we've been, tell me about your God. I mean, how can I have a relationship like you have? That happens. I mean, but it it starts with God's people living a life that is so honoring and and to Him that it attracts people to God. We are literally supposed to be like magnets for Christ. We're supposed to be so magnetic because we reflect God that we just draw people under the cross. Because let's be honest, let's be honest. Isn't it Jesus that made the difference in our life? Isn't it Jesus? It's not that great job that you have. It's not that incredible house you live in or neighborhood. It's not all the motorcycles and the boats you have that make that difference. They're fun for the weekend, but they don't change your life. What changed your life? It was Jesus. He changed it. And so our life should be all geared around that. I will stop. But David understood the secret to praising him. David did. And I don't know about you, but I want to be like David. I want to be one that exalts God. I don't even like my family knowing when I've had bad days. 
They don't. I don't come home and I don't like that. Why? Because I want them to understand how good God is. I could come home, every one of us could come home every day and just complain and whine and all that about what we had to go through that day. Does that exalt God at all? No. Didn't Paul even say, man, I've learned to be content with money or poor with food, with no food? Didn't, didn't he learn contentment in God? Because he understood it was all about God. So church, let me ask you. Do you want to be one who praises Him? And want to be one that draws people because you praise Him? That's your decision. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank You and we praise You for Your Word and how You just instruct us. And God, for what uh, David shared just in those three verses about praising God. God, thank You for His example and His words so that it can challenge us. Father, right now, I lift up this time of, uh, of decision. First, I want to lift up the individual here that goes to church, or maybe this is one of their first times, but they do not have a personal relationship with you. Father, it all starts there. It starts with our relationship with you. So if there's anyone here today that doesn't know if they really have a relationship with you, but they would love to, to know that, in just a moment, when I stop talking, we will stand and the music will play and we will invite you to come forward to talk to someone about that relationship with Jesus. Church, you're the second group. If you're here today and you know you've not been real consistent in praising Him, you've got a decision to make. Some of you need to just come to the altar. You don't need to talk to anyone. You need to just come to the altar and pray. And confess what your issue has been. And move on. If you need someone to talk to, we'll have one of our deacons available to talk to you. But this time is all about us responding to what the Spirit of God has spoken to us about. God be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. If you would stand.